You okay? Uh, that's the only thing about my phone, doing the phone. Uh, people are calling me. Don't you worry. Uh, I went to a concert last night, and people are calling to follow up. About don't, worry, don't worry. Don't worry, buddy. Okay. Uh, so you have... Roughly, uh, during the period of what we call the Nubian, the 25th dynasty of Kemet or Egypt, uh, we have evidence of Africans sailing out of the Mediterranean down into what we call the West African Sea or the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, we have evidence that they have visited. They've been here. There's a presence, a cultural presence, a physical presence in Mexico, not only with the mm -hmm. Omic Stoneheads, but also with hundreds of terracotta artifacts. Mm -hmm. uh, these artifacts, uh, these little doll figures, like mm -hmm. dolls, okay. you know, we call okay. them uh, They have uh, African hair, woolly hair, mm -hmm. African textured hair, and the features of African people. And they're found all around the same location these Stoneheads are found in, in Mexico, around you're, Mexico City. You're talking about around Veracruz, um the Veracruz yes. era, the, the um, Costa Chica, that that yeah. part of Mexico. Uh, look, it's the San Lorenzo and yeah. uh, what are these locations? Uh, there's three major locations. Uh, the Omic, uh, I think they were. Um, you got the Veracruz. Yeah. Uh, you have um, the uh, obviously they call it obviously the whole area of Costa Chica, but primarily okay. primarily Veracruz is one of the major ones that stand out uh, in my mind. That predominantly the heads were found. The, where, the, where the Omic heads were found. So yeah. the Omic heartland. Yeah, the heartland. Yes. Mm -hmm. Omic civilization. Uh, and so you have these. And, and the oldest one, uh, well, the first one that was discovered, I believe, 1862, by uh, one of the one of the villagers in, in, in Mexico. Uh, ironically, uh, the oldest, I believe, has these. Well, I know it has seven Nubian style cornrow braids in the back. Mm -hmm. And I believe this only this is the only one that, that as far as I can tell from Sadi and Van Sertima, mm -hmm. Renoko Rashidi, and other folks, mm -hmm. uh, thus thus far to date, none of the other Omic heads have this hairstyle, this Nubian cornrow style braids in in the back. Okay. Uh, features on the front, the Afrikoid, the, the 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 nose and 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 the full lips, and and so some scholars have related the helmet, the headgear mm -hmm. to uh, some of the the um, the uh, the headgear the head that the warriors used to wear during the uh, the Nubian dynasty and the 25th dynasty, mm -hmm. which which many scholars want to they want to limit the African presence even in the Nile Valley to the 25th dynasty. Mm -hmm. This is the only dynasty where Africans were present. It's toward the end of the civilization. Yeah. And they'll give us that one. They call them the the, the black pharaohs. Black yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Black pharaoh. One one scholar uh, back in I don't know he was writing in probably the early 20th century, maybe the 1950s or 60s, he even used the N-word, mm -hmm. call them the, the nigger kings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, just, just to give clear definition uh, that these were Africans. Mm -hmm. But they don't want, the argument has been, and the controversy has been, in the beginning, during the pyramid age, uh, dynasties three through six, or we can say one through six, was there a strong African presence? during the high-tech age of early Egypt when the pyramids were built, during the age of Imhotep uh, and the Step Pyramid uh, and uh, those early uh, pharaohs in dynasties one through six. So, uh, again, <laughs> I didn't want to get stuck there because that's, no, no, that's, mm -hmm. that's another conversation. But the um, that there is, Van Sertima talks about this, uh, and there were other people uh, uh, that preceded Van Sertima there was a brother named LeGrand Clegg who had studied this for many, many years, probably about 40 years. Uh, you had people like J.A. Rogers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think of the brother Harold uh, Harold Lawrence. Uh, I think he changed his name. He has an African name. And I think he's maybe he may, may be passed on. But there were people that preceded Ivan Van Sertima that also studied this African presence in, in America <clears throat> before Columbus. Uh, and so... Um, I think, uh, what was his name? Uh, Boyce Rensberger did some nice stuff for a science magazine in the early 1980s. But uh, I've got dozens of magazines and, and, and books on this subject. But, okay, the second period that we have pretty solid evidence during the reign of, um, um, actually it was Abubakari II of Mali, the, the uh, middle, what we call the medieval kingdoms hmm. of Ghana, Mali, and Songa, you have Mali, mm -hmm. uh, and you have um, Abubakar II, who um, 
Van Sherman and others say in 1311, I believe he sent a fleet of ships into, uh, we'll call it the West African Sea, or to, right. into the Atlantic mm -hmm. to explore mm -hmm. the unknown regions. And they, of course, they had to have uh, longitude and latitude. They had to have right. navigation instruments mm -hmm. in order to navigate the seas, the waters. Uh, and uh, I guess from what the way the story goes, the first fleet, they must have ran into a violent storm, possibly a hurricane. And uh, the one captain said that he noticed the other ships were had perished in the, in, in the ocean. And so he turned around and went back to, to Mali, hmm. to West Africa. Uh, the way the story goes, he was the only, was the only surviving ship. Hmm. So the next year, Abu Bakari sends a fleet. They say he led a fleet of 200 ships out into to explore the Atlantic. And he, what scholars believe is he landed in Mexico and began then. Uh, they, of course, they were trading uh, this this trade that was carried being carried on with the Native Americans. And uh, so Columbus actually visited West Africa. And I think in, in the first chapter of Van Sertima's book, he talks and he discusses uh, Don Juan, the king of Portugal. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. Right. I, I believe he was actually having a conversation with it at this time. Some of these things we haven't looked at for years. We haven't right. read in the books for years. Just, just we're just going from memory. Right, right, now. right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so, so Columbus, I guess, was a doubting Thomas. He didn't want to accept the fact. He was in denial that Africans had preceded him to this so-called new world. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> but he had actually went to West Africa. Uh, there's a lot more we can say about this. King Henry, uh, they had a navigational school in Portugal, and Columbus supposedly went as as a boy, and yeah. you know he got all this. This is from uh, Henry. But, Henry the uh, you talking about Henry the Navigator? Yes, mm -hmm. navigational school, mm -hmm. and they say uh, the sister 1420s, 1440s. Uh, he had been uh, this navigational school. Uh, he has had established in Portugal, but anyway, uh, so Columbus does make it to um, the Western Hemisphere, because we know he thought he was in India. Sure. Right, right. Sure. So he runs into these indigenous people, uh, and they have these gold-tipped spears, um, and they call it guanin, right? Gold-tipped metal spears. And so Columbus wants to know, wh where's the gold? Where, 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 where's the gold coming from? Uh, where is the source of the gold? And so they actually told Columbus, we've been trading with these black skinned men mm. from the south and southeast, right? Mm. We've been trading with these black skinned men. So Columbus, again, a doubting Thomas, he sends samples of the gold of the guanin back to Spain to have it examined by the metallurgists, right? Mm. These people who specialize in metals, right? Mm. So when they break the composition down, they discover that it wasn't pure gold, but it was a combination of, I think it was copper and silver, and 32 parts, it, I forget the actual mathematical breakdown, but it was three, it contained gold, uh, I think silver, and I think it was bronze, or copper, you may be able to help me with this, but it wasn't pure gold. But what the important thing for us to remember is, the metallurgists, they told Columbus, they said, look, this is the same type of gold that's being produced in West Africa. Hmm. This is the only place in the world hmm. that Af are mixing these metals, that, you know, to 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 create their gold. Mm -hmm. And I read in one of the books I read over the years, it says that Africans like to smell their gold too. It's a certain smell that they like hmm. about the gold, the way it smells, and so they infuse these other metals uh, <laughs> into their gold. And it, it I guess it has a, a distinctive smell to mm -hmm. it. Okay. Right? Okay. So, so, Columbus, so anyway, we're talking uh, roughly 750 to 800 BC, and then we come all the way down to 1311, 1312, uh, we've got AD, right? Okay. Uh, more recently, uh, in more recent times. So as far as I can tell, with everything that I've read and studied, there's no sufficient evidence to say that Africans were here prior to the Omic civilization in 750, 800 BC. Now, let me let me say this though. I have to add this, but this is this is really peculiar. There has been a discovery of a woman in Brazil, the remains of a woman, uh, the fossil remains of a woman in Brazil, 12,000 years ago. 
right? Okay. And I think they dubbed her Luz Lucia uh, because they were kind of uh, comparing her to Lucy that was found in Ethiopia. Uh, what, three point, Lucy was 3.5 million years old. Lu and Lucy, what we have to always remind people is Lucy uh, was not Homo sapiens sapiens. She was not us. The, 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 and and Diop gets into this. I mean, there were several types, even Homo erectus that left Africa a million years ago, 1.5 million years ago, was not us. It was not Homo sapiens sapiens in terms of cranial capacity, his brain, his size, his anatomical makeup. Mm. He was not us. He'd be no Neanderthal. Mm. not us right right so right. You, these pre what they call and without getting into the all the technicalities of of uh what we call prehistory and uh yeah i hate to even do it in my class sometimes we had to I, when i was talking about the african origins of humanity we began with homo sapiens sapiens i didn't even want to discuss homo erectus australopithecus all those pre-human those hominid hominid types that came before us i was just trying to get to the fact that like Van Serman, this is the important thing we have to understand, that the human family at its most advanced stage of development, Homo sapiens sapiens, which is what you and I are, Brother Chester, mm -hmm. we, all, we also had our origins on the African continent because the ar argument was that Homo erectus left Africa, Africa a million years ago, and when he went moved into Asia and, 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 and Europe, well, that is where he evolved hmm. and became, you know, in the intelligent, modern thinking, wise human being that you and I are. Hmm. That he that whole, that he had to leave Africa before he elevated. He got the elevated consciousness, or he became modern wow. human. That's very interesting. That's a very interesting. It, 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 so they they wanted to not the well. They said Africa was a kindergarten. It was a preschool that mankind or humanity had to evolve, they had to go to other environments to become what we are today. And so they could deny Africa the origin of really the modern human family. And that has been the argument. So now that we know that we found fossils beginning with the leakies in the 1960s, they found many, many fossils of Homo sapiens sapiens in East and Southern Africa. There are four sites. And so to corroborate the whole mitochondrial DNA, the wire chromosome DNA, the nuclear DNA, and the microsatellite DNA that's been studied. These studies are independent. They're, they're all the international st study scientists that have studied this DNA, this genetic stuff, right? And so they all come to the conclusion that we have, I could read some stuff, but maybe we can get sure. more extensive, more deep into this. But yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in uh, matter of fact, in the journal, African Africans in Early Asia, Renoko Rashidi and James Brunson, I believe, write a piece called Small Blacks um, at the African Presence in, in Early, I'm, I'm trying to think of the subtitle, but they actually begin, they document some of these articles that begin appearing in um, uh, the journals called like Nature and, uh, let me see, what was the other one that came out? Uh, so I, I don't think they... Are you talking? Uh, are you talking about the um, when him and James Ronson wrote about the African presence in early East Asia? That that's on page. Yeah. Okay. There's, a, there's an article. It's called Small Blacks. Uh, I used to uh, give it to. I give copies to my students because they mentioned a study that was done by a team of eleven scientists at Oxford, England, and um, they talk about this was the nuclear DNA study. And, what, and why this article is important is because it makes the connection between the fossils in Africa that are found in Ethiopia. I think there are two places in Ethiopia and a couple in southern Africa. And so they, they said that our, our study is supportive of the fossil evidence. Our data with the nuclear DNA study <clears throat> supports the fossil evidence. It says that, yes... We have this out of Africa. These out of the the man, the human the human family uh, emerged out of Africa, roughly 150,000, 200,000 years ago, which is what Diab was saying before he passed away in 1986. Hmm. We already had this, we, and, and so it's so it's so beautiful when you look at Shaikh Anta Diab and the interview that was done in 80 in 1985 
and we really didn't need none of this DNA, really, right? Mm -hmm. It just really just, it, it strengthens and reinforces what we already knew. And you got people like John Henry Clark and Dr. Ben and these other master scholars who were saying, you know, well, Bruce Williams, as an archaeologist, the same thing with the uh, the Nubian origins of, of, of the Egyptian civilization, mm -hmm. that we, we had our historians, our, well, I'm saying African historians, the black historians, we had enough historical documentation. We really didn't need the archaeological, the incense burner that Bruce Williams was. He revealed in uh, Anthrop what was called Archaeology Magazine. I think it was September, October, 1980, might have been 1979. And this incense burner that depicted these images of a king on a throne. Uh, uh, this was now. This is 200 years before the first Egyptian king. They called Norma Menes, right? Norma Menes, right? And roughly, what is it? Norma Menes is the first. Uh, yeah, that's king the first, yeah, that's the first dynasty. To unite upper and lower the two yes. kingdoms, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But long before he and he was a Nubian, but long before he even ascended to the throne and united the two lands of upper and lower Kemet, you have these these other fa I think it was a dozen of them that ruled uh, two centuries before <laughs> before uh, the first Egyptian dynasty. So there's a lot of I got I must say that archaeology, anthropology, they've really helped us to piece back the story, uh, our story, our historical narrative, uh, and uh, they've kind of put flesh on the bone, so to speak. Yeah. They fit some, some missing pieces mm -hmm. <clears throat> of the story, and, it's, and we would know what we know about Africa if it wasn't for archaeology uh, right now. Some of the archaeological discoveries that have been made about ancient kingdoms, so-called lost kingdoms, like this, this article by Bruce Williams, the lost pharaohs of Nubia, the lost pharaohs, they were lost. And so he goes back, he doesn't begin the 25th dynasty at the end of Egyptian civilization. So when the Africans came in on the scene right at the end, you weren't there in the very beginning. Hmm. And even Herodotus, even Herodotus told us in 450 BC that the Egyptians were black skinned and woolly haired. Hmm. And this, you can go from 3200, 3300 BCE and go all the way through consistently through all of the 30 dynasties and go all the way to the very end. And Herodotus is telling us in 450 BC, the Egyptians are still, you know, black. Mm. They still have black skin mm. and woolly hair. And they like like the Ethiopians, they call them the burnt face. That's that's what the yeah. name means in Greek. Yeah. yeah. So so anyway, to go back, the question you ask is very complex and it's complicated because I I haven't I don't embrace and I don't accept any of this. I don't know where the scholarship is coming from, this information about us being here, and uh, we have a presence before the so-called Native American or the indigenous yeah. people here. Yeah. I do, I, I can say that we, there was a presence, we have a presence, and we have a, it's very influential, mm -hmm. a cultural presence, uh, around 750, 800 BCE, mm -hmm. but to the best of my knowledge, we can't go back 20, 25,000 years ago and explain that we were here before the indigenous people. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I found it only, I didn't really mean to, um, <laughs> I didn't really want to present it initially because I felt as though I don't want to keep adding light to something that's not true, right? But sometimes we have to speak on it for a bit to clear the minds with those who are teetering on, on, on how credible it is. And I've always asked people this, so ask yourself, where is it coming from and what's the purpose? Oftentimes, okay. I find these ideologies are coming from people who just don't want to be called African. I always, okay. it's all, it seems like there's a common denominator of people that don't want to be considered or, or um, embracing their origin in the last four or 500 years of West Africa. They come up with these ideologies or what else they want to be. So right. in, in hindsight, you're either going to be West African because they came over here and they, and they did some trading and some and, and, and some and some uh, some bit of establishment and civilization in, 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 um, in South America, which was West African. Or you're going to be West African that was here some four or five hundred years ago in which we were brought. Either way, you West African. Yeah, and but, we all come out of Africa. You cannot deny. I don't care how far you go, but you cannot deny that. Everyone, every, all homos, all of us who call ourselves human, uh, we have this common ancestry, right. this connection, right. and uh, uh, there is no hierarchy of race. 
uh, we all, matter of fact, uh, <laughs> how can they be, uh, you mean talking about uh, white supremacy, uh, white superiority, how can you be superior when you are a child, mm-hmm. you are uh, you are spawned from uh, the, <laughs> you are a genetic, we'll say mutation, right. you, you certainly come from uh, your 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 ancestors are African. Mm-hmm. Basically, you have African ancestors, and it's it's kind of a tech, technical argument, but right. there's no way of getting around that. Uh, I wrote a piece uh, years ago called "White Supremacists Cannot Deny Their Genetic Roots in Africa." Because mm-hmm. <laughs> this whole idea, and, and 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 our people need to understand this first and foremost too, because some of us still subscribe to the belief or the myth mythology of African inferiority. You know, for the racial inferior, for whatever reason, and and part of that denying our blackness or our Africanness, we still sometimes want to deny that. Uh, some of us feel that darker skin, or browner skin, uh, you may feel like you. Uh, that's not, you know, that's inferior to lighter skin mm-hmm. folks like myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, still, we still struggle with the with the hair issue. Yeah, <clears throat> good hair, bad hair. So, this internal racism, and we call it colorism. This this whole complex. The color complex, and I think you posted something one time on your in your Facebook page or one of your videos about the brown bag. Yes, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. down the whole brown bag. And so we, yeah. you know, we still struggle with this, you know, to find to find ourselves. We said we were black and beautiful in the 1960s, but how many of us, if we did believe it and we embraced that concept that we were beautiful, right. did we transmit it to our children? Right, our children that we're intelligent, we're beautiful, just the way you are. Uh, and I think, but I think we need to start when we teach history, we teach the history of humanity. The first, where I start is with Africa mm. being the origins of humanity, because I think that's one of the ways we're going to dismantle and deconstruct this whole idea <laughs> of uh, white racial superiority. The whole ideology of white supremacy is, okay. is just, you know, you, you it cannot stand on the fact because Caucasians came very late mm-hmm. Europe. And Africans were in Europe. They, I mean, we were on the continent, African people, doing our thing for, what, 150 years or so before there was a European. Mm-hmm. And long before there was European civilization. Right, so, right. I mean, so we know history and we should teach accurate, correct, we should teach the truth. And so when we understand that, the, or the beginnings, and then you look at the, how things, you look at the you chronicle history, the chronology of it, how we come down to uh, what roughly the earliest civilizations in the Nile Valley and in the so-called, we'll say, Middle East, right? Yeah. And they still sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's that's very recent when you look at a hundred thousand years of history, and which was which hasn't been a lot of it hasn't been written down. I mean, we've got we've got some solid evidence, but writing doesn't appear. Uh, say until well about six thousand years ago, roughly, you know. So you don't have writing, systematic writing, but uh, maybe. But you have other forms of arts and science. I mean, what is how old is the so-called Sphinx? Mm-hmm. And the other look at going into the tombs uh, and uh, some of the other Maya temples and tombs of the Nile Valley, even in uh, in in what we call Nubia. You find man, people were writing and creating art, architecture and what probably music, mathematics, all these things. So we we had civilization long before uh, this 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 thing happened in the so-called Middle East. Okay. In Mesopotamia, right? So well, anyway, no, but I, if there's something else I want to say, but it, maybe it'll come back to me about the whole color thing and and um, you know we've had all these myths and prejudices about the African continent and being a dark continent and and a land of uncivilized people and. Uh, uh, savages and infidels, and mm-hmm. you know we've had all this miseducation, mm-hmm. and uh, and so um, in the struggle to become whole again, collectively to become whole, mm-hmm. uh, or even as an individual, uh, it, it's a serious struggle. Um, and and like my man uh, Professor Jacob Carruthers talks about this intellectual warfare yeah. that you and I are engaged in, we're involved in, and we not only conduct this intellectual warfare. Uh, we're, we're working, we're dealing with our own folks, but we're dealing, with, of course, with the uh, the oppressive forces that are out there. Sure. Uh, K through 12, and even at the university level. But but we we many times we've got to uh, the struggle to uh, <laughs> our folks are sometimes so brainwashed and indoctrinated 
and I faced this in my classroom uh, many, many years. Um, matter of fact, let me just, I'll, I'll just summarize this by saying that I always would make reference to a book called Africans in Their History by, uh, by uh, what's his name? Uh, I got it right here on my bed, I think. Uh, Africans in Their History, of uh, Joseph Harris, who taught at Howard University for many, many years. The first chapter in the book is uh, called, I think he calls it, a Tradition of Myths and Stereotypes. It's a whole tradition, uh, and he talks about several centuries, these myths and stereotypes that we've got to debunk and dispel before we begin to even address the actual history of our people. Mm. Yeah. We have to, we have to, we have to deconstruct. We have to. <laughs> you got to go to war mm -hmm. and got to destroy the 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 stereotypes mm -hmm. and the myths mm -hmm. about Africa and African people, mm -hmm. and then you can now you can teach the history, right? So. Uh, I see now there's an emergence of these another type of mythology, um, uh, this 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 narrative that I think a lot of our people are looking at YouTube videos. I don't think we're doing much studying um, at this time, uh, so we looked at the YouTube videos, and then there's a uh, quite a few amateurs, there's quite a few people that are just coming into knowledge yeah. and they've got zeal and passion, and so they take a they take an idea concept and they run with it because again. Um, you know, the idea that our history begins with slavery, everybody rejects that, right? And we all reject that. So, you know, there is greatness. We, we and, 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 and the, the idea that we didn't come here as slaves, that we came as as uh, <laughs> as pilots, crew members, we were directed, we were, uh, you know, we were in charge of our own ships. We came and we traded and we were going back and forth from the continent to, we, you know, to the Americas. Uh, it, it's a it's a beautiful idea, you know. We were we were liberated, we were independent, we we're doing our thing, and that's partially true. But you cannot deny the great enslavement. Mm. You know, there's no way we can get around <laughs> we can get around that. Mm. So some seem to be wanting to deny the fact that we we oh we didn't come here as slaves. We've never been slaves. You know, that never happened. That's a myth. Slavery is a myth. The slave trade and all that yeah. is it, yeah. yeah. So uh, that I find that really crazy. And this latest latest statement by uh. Kanye West and people, I'm not going to even entertain it, but people no. are going back. I think even Mr. Farrakhan had to address some of the yeah. some of that nonsense. But yeah, man, uh, I, so, didn't, I didn't even get in. I, 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 I didn't get in it much. I made my statement and my statement was, all right, if that's the case, if, if slavery was a choice, then so was the Holocaust. So you right. I'm right. not going to allow you to marginalize our, you know, our ancestors or desecrate their their uh, sacrifice. But right. yet and still, you 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 don't you don't blink one eye when someone speaks about the Holocaust and write all of these books. And I'm not I'm not sitting here and saying that the Holocaust was wasn't a, a bad thing. I mean, listen, I don't I don't want anything to happen to anyone. However, my history my history is is just as important to know about the there. So if you can keep making all of these movies about your Holocaust. And everyone finds it all fine and grandy uh, and dandy. You do the same for the for the slave trade, particularly right. for those who were involved in the slave in the Holocaust are culprits in the slave trade and who have built. And that, we, <laughs> yeah. but that's a whole right. different topic we're going to get into. Yes, you know, but, but I lo love the the fact that the the Jewish community universally uh, never forget. You know, their their thing is never forget, never again. Uh, this is this is not going to happen. So we're going to keep that memory, even though it's a, a very dark and um, uh, man, it's 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 a ugly, uh, really really, uh, what would I, what I say? Um, that that experience, the Holocaust, the ten or eleven years, and, and and the whole thing of genocide and extermination. I mean, but they they even go back and try and, and, and go into their thing with Egypt, you know, the Exodus and all that. They they yeah. connect with all that too. They, they, they claim that history. So, but they say that they were go always going to remember. They're never going to forget it, and they're going to not going to let us forget it. Right. And we, on the other hand, and they seem to. Um, I, I read a book, African Voices of the Slave Trade: Beyond the Silence and the Shame, uh, by a sister. She, uh, I think she's from Jamaica, and she taught at Spelman College. <clears throat> I think her name, last name is Annette Bailey, is her name, I believe. 
And she had a paragraph in there, and it was uh, I've shared it with audiences before because I thought it was so powerful that she she was comparing our attitude, and 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 she was demonstrating how the Jewish folks uh, they have this sense of solidarity mm-hmm. and and unification, that memory of their suffering uh, and their struggle to be liberated and emancipate themselves, they they stay, I mean, they remain connected to that history. Right. And it, it gives them, it empowers them. Right. 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 So us, it just seemed like, she said, well, why doesn't it do the same for us right. as a people? Right. Th- that shared memory, that shared experience. Right. Uh, I think Du Bois wrote about this. Malcolm talked about this. I mean, man, we have this, we have, and Du Bois even thought about that because of our shared experience, Coming out of slavery and Jim Crow, all that oppression we struggled through, that man, that would create a a a, a bond right. that could never be broken, right? That right. we would, man. But I mean, you would th- think so because that's the, danger, and that's the danger of the disconnection, right? Right. You know, because when you remain connected to your ancestors and that history, then you would think over generations, generationally, that bond would become even stronger. Right. And that's what I find very ad- admirable about the Jewish community. I don't be hating on them. Mm. I said they got something, some ideology, some something that that keeps them <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, in, in unity. Sure. And sure. Absolutely. Self- yeah. 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 And, and so I say we need to borrow whatever it is. Let's let's use that. Whatever they're using, they're utilizing. We can use that for our Pan-African, you know, our uh, mm-hmm. aspirations. We yes, can certainly sure. use that sure. same method. Sure. I agree. Yeah. Well, let me let me remind the audience again, and I and and I I was so caught up in my excitement I forgot to mention. Uh, Professor Williams, you know, he he taught at the Institute of Arizona, the Banu Institute of. Oh, well, that's that's an organization we found. Oh, the organization you found. Okay, okay. Institute of Arizona. Yes. Could you elaborate on that, sir? Please. I I I should have did it at the beginning. I apologize, but could you please? Could you please? Not a problem. Not a problem. Not a problem. Thank you. Well, it's it's interesting that. Um, well, I was teaching at uh, the Mason Community College. We did 22 years, and I, uh, I've i actually tried to launch several what I call community study groups, mm-hmm. and uh, we had some unsuccessful attempts. And then back in 2010, uh, I had a colleague uh, who was a librarian. He's the editor of the senior editor for the Journal of Pan-African Studies at this time. Well, he's he's renamed it Afrocology okay. the Journal. Okay. His name is Itabari M. Zulu Sr. Okay. And uh, he was a librarian at the school. And, uh, man, uh, I saw his book. Uh, he had a book, I think it was called The Afrocentric Paradigm. He two books. I can't remember the title of the second book. But, anyway, I saw one of his books, and just the fact that he had mentioned the term African-centered, mm-hmm. got my, and, and I said, I've got to meet this brother, and so I met him, and we clicked, and it was right right around the time I was planning to do a Malcolm X Film Festival at the school for the students. Okay. We're going to do a short film every week and have some discussion, so we had to get started early, and uh, so I mentioned the idea to Itabari, and he said, well, hey, you know, I, I'd like to work with you on that. I can help you out, mm-hmm. so that was in the spring of... Uh, 2000, uh, early, let me see, must have been, oh, well, I guess it was 2010. Anyway, he and I became really good friends, and okay. we began to, we do, do projects together, we worked together, uh, on, on, we did things on campus and off campus, right? So then I had this idea, I said, well, man, I, I'd like to uh, start this study group, you know, an African-centered uh, study group where we look at our history and cultural heritage from ancient times to the present, right? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I, uh, I was doing some presentations in the community, and I made the announcement about the Benue Institute. I think it was uh, March of 2010, and then we had our, our first official meeting in April of 2010. So we just we just completed our eight-year eight, eight anniversary uh, last month uh, in April, right? Mm-hmm. Eight years old. Itabari was my co-founder. He, uh, he, we were co-founders and co-facilitators. Uh, he was, uh, he had, he had my back. I mean, we were, we were, we were partners in this thing. Right. And so he's, uh, about three or four years ago, he moved, he relocated back to Los Angeles, but the group is still going. Uh, and it's an African centered study group. Okay. We call it the educational collective, a think tank, so to speak. 
Uh, but we don't just study. We actually facilitate uh, community programs. We pay tribute to uh, Brother Malcolm X Shabazz. We've been doing that for eight years. We also uh, uh, we've developed community programs. All these are educational uh, programs that we do. We have uh, around Marcus Garvey in August, August 17th. We, we've been doing this consistently for eight years. Okay. Uh, we, we're involved in Juneteenth. We, we, we have our own Kwanzaa celebrations. So we are, um, we're a study group. Mm -hmm. And at, present, as a pre at the present time, we're, we're about to complete, um, we've, been looking, we've been looking at uh, Maulana Karinga's Introduction to Black Studies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Probably the most widely used textbook in Black Studies uh, on, on on major university campuses, college campuses, uh, and uh, there, he has about maybe 150 pages where he deals with Black historiography. Okay. And so and we've been it's excellent, man. Very well done. He really just basically uh, he's assembled uh, a lot of information. He condenses things and and he's he's, he's he summarizes very well. And what he does is he wants to uh, inspire the reader to, of course, conduct more research. So, so he has bibliography there. So he's just basically just dealing with the surface. And then hopefully he, motiv he wants to motivate the reader or the student to go ahead and do their own independent study and research. And so, it's, so it's a great book, Introduction. It's a great introductory text. That's the one we're currently looking at. We reviewed, um, the first book we reviewed was Afrocentricity. Uh, I think it's called The Subtitles of Theory of Social Change by Malefi Asante. We looked at African power, and I know Ace's book deals with socialization mm -hmm. uh, in, in the community. And then we also reviewed uh, the Kenyan uh, anti-colonial writer, uh, Ngugi Wa uh, he, he wrote a book a few years ago called uh, Something Torn and New Toward an African Renaissance. And it's one of the major. Uh, uh, you've had you've had you've, uh, a handful of anti-colonial thinkers and activists uh, in in uh, in Kenya and um, in uh, in Nigeria and in Ghana. Um, Chinwezu. Uh, you've had uh, some of the other names I can't think of, but Ngugi has taught. In the United States, I know he's. I think he's taught in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I think he's taught so on, on the East Coast somewhere. He, I mean, he may have been at Temple. Malefi may have brought him to Temple. I believe that happened. He was at Temple, and then he may have gone out to San Francisco State. I think wherever Wade Nobles is, somewhere out on the West Coast as well. But we want we what we primarily we wanted to do was we had we, we had three foundational texts. Okay. And we would try to immerse our our study group members in the philosophy and the ideology of African-centered thinking, or what they call Afrocentricity. Before we even looked at the history, we wanted to ground our, our, our members in this whole idea of what is, what is Eurocentricity or Eurocentric thinking, and, and what is that all about, and versus you know, African-centered thinking or Afrocentricity. So we wanted to look at differences and, and, and try to really get our members to understand why we needed to embrace the African-centered idea. Okay. Okay. So that's, we did that for a couple of years. So, so Itabari was on board with me from the very beginning, and I have a couple of brothers now that have been with me. It's funny that we we've always seemed to have uh, the majority of males. Uh, we have right now we probably have uh, maybe a good seven or eight males and maybe three or four females that come and go. But mm -hmm. we've been right around ten members uh, since our inception in 2010. Uh, but I felt like we needed to, what I was doing on campus, I needed to make myself accessible and I needed to take uh, my knowledge and, and that information uh, that I've been, I've been very fortunate uh, to, um, I guess, accumulate over the last 40 years. I wanted to give back and share that with my community as well. Right. So I've always wanted to do the study group idea is, uh, and I've gotten uh, like yourself, Sometimes I get a little frustrated with, with, with my folks uh, when I don't feel like things are being reciprocated. Right. But we, we've hung in there and uh, and it's, it's, it's proven. This is the other groups I was involved in. They, they, they fizzled out after about a year. OK. And the new institute has been around for eight years. So okay. it's eight. OK. OK. Yeah. So it's uh, just an African centered think tank. Uh, but we're also we feel like we, we need to remember and uh, lift up, pay homage to Malcolm, to Garvey, 
Uh, those are the main two. Uh, I, we've got a brother here that does the Paul Robeson tribute. He's, he's doing that in a few weeks, matter of fact. Because what, uh, what, so, what I'm going to do, uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to post this on the link for people to get in touch with too. So I'm, I'm okay. So I'm going to put okay. that in. That's going to be all in the link uh, for people. Yeah, to, we have our Facebook presence, and that was okay. done. We reactivated that uh, about three years ago, a little over three years ago, and at the suggestion of my son-in-law, he just said, "Well, you know, I, I wasn't on Facebook. I didn't have a personal Facebook page, but." For the benefit of the Benue Institute of Arizona, we thought we would go with social media. Okay. Right? Yeah. And uh, it's been it's been advantageous. It's, it's been beneficial. We've connected with your you. We've connected with people on the continent in Europe. Uh, and we, I, I'm really still trying to promote the uh, the Journal of Pan African Studies that we that I was the guest editor for. We edited on uh, Antonio Furman uh, of Haiti, and so we're using that as a vehicle as well. We want to. Use the Facebook. Every time I, if you, if anybody that's looked at my Facebook page, even recently, we've had some of those memories after a year or two, they come up and I've posted, I've shared a lot about Antonio Furman, his book, his life and legacy. And we just want him to become as well known as Du Bois, as, as, as maybe Frederick Douglass, uh, as a Carter G. Woodson, or somebody like we want him to become a household name as well. And because they speak French in Haiti, this was another way we became disconnected because we were speaking English here, the King's English, mm -hmm. primarily in this country. Mm -hmm. And so people who spoke Spanish, Portuguese, French, you know, we were, we weren't bilingual or multilingual, so we couldn't really connect. Mm -hmm. We couldn't communicate. Mm -hmm. So luckily, Furman's book been tra has been translated to English, and people can read it. For those of us who speak English, we can read his his, uh, his scholarship now. So uh, Outstanding. Well, let me, let's fast forward a little bit then, Professor. I mean, um, so... You go through this, you go through this growth for yourself. You're an mm -hmm. educator, author. We're going to get in some of your works later on, some of your articles. One in particular, I really want you to elaborate on. Take us where you you first where you you meet uh, Renoko Rushidi. You meet some of the uh, you meet Ivan Van Sertima, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Clark, you know, Doctor. Take us right. through that process, how that all uh, unfolded. Okay, okay. Uh, and I want you to help keep me on track because... <laughs> okay, you know, well, I'll try. Renoko, Renoko, meeting Renoko Rashidi in the early 80s, man, it was probably like 83, 1983 or so. Hmm. Renoko is a beautiful brother. He's always been ahead of the game. Brilliant, brilliant young brother. Uh, and uh, he had a he was employed at Compton Community College, and the de the department that he worked for I can't think of the the, the actual name, mm -hmm. but but it was it was, he, he was very fortunate that the department he worked out of allowed him to organize and present like many symposiums on campus. Okay. Uh, and uh, I don't even know, man. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember how I how I uh, even first met Renoko. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, let me think. It may have been a friend of mine, Obadelli Williams, who lived. He he transitioned um, about two years ago. He lived in Atlanta. A good friend of Asa Hilliard and Charles Finch. Matter of fact, they had a new study group in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, 84, 85. They had a return to the Source Conference. But anyway. Obadelli, or I have another friend in Chicago, a brother named Moses uh, Bowie. One of the two of them may have. I was I was going to Los Angeles because I had another friend who lived in L.A. Some kind of way they must have mentioned Renoko's name to me mm -hmm. and or oh, given me his phone number. Okay. And because uh, I can't remember exactly how because I we actually I actually he invited me to stay in his apartment mm -hmm. at, at least on two different occasions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, man, this is crazy. I'm trying to remember. He must have picked me up and brought me to his place from the airport because mm -hmm. I didn't have another way unless my other buddy dropped me off. But anyway, I stayed with him. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a very, you know, into, in part, in part, he's a single bachelor, of, you know, a mm -hmm. single guy. Mm -hmm. But I was impressed with his book collection, even that, that first visit. Mm -hmm. I was looking at his his his, his, his uh, enormous book collection, mm -hmm. and how he was he's a, he was a bibliophile like myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so we connected in probably '83 or so. Uh, 
And I, uh, I actually attended a couple of these conferences where Van Sherman was a presenter, mm-hmm. the Grand Clay was a matter of fact, he had, I think, one of the first ones that they, that they, um, they had was Africans in Mexico. Mm-hmm. The African presence in Mexico um, at Compton Community College. And I remember I met Alexander von Wutenau. Mm-hmm. Was he was it, probably ninety two then? Mm-hmm. He was probably was early nineties. And him and Van Sertima were really good friends. Okay. And Van Sertima, there's a photograph of Van Sertima. Uh, I don't know which journal, uh, the African presence in early America. I don't know whether it's, I think it's the, the initial Journal of African Civilizations uh, on uh, the theme being Africans in early America. And there's a photograph of Van Sertima sitting having a conversation with Alexander Van Wootenau. And Van Wootenau, Van Sertima says this, he had the largest collection of African artifacts or Mesoamerican artifacts of anybody in the world yeah. that he had met. Yeah. So he would make this pilgrimage every year to go and visit Van Wootenau and mm-hmm. someone took a photograph of the two of them. Mm-hmm. So uh, so Van Wootenau was present there and it was an honor to meet him. We took a photograph together if I can find it. Okay. <laughs> uh, Van Sertima was there. Uh, at Compton, he was, I'm sure he was the keynote speaker. Mm-hmm. And I see you may have done the press, but I did that uh, two or three times. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, you know, stayed with Renoco. Uh, so let me fast forward a little bit. So I was doing research on Africans in Asia somewhat. I was reading Jay Rogers, John Jackson, uh, people, you know, people like that. And I was looking at Godfrey Higgins, Gerald Massey, Albert, a lot of these British, mm-hmm. uh, 19th century British scholars. Right. Right. Massey, and, uh, and but, 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 but I need to mention. Uh, uh, Constantine Duvalny or C.F. Mm-hmm. Valny mm-hmm. who uh, wrote Ruins of Empires in about 1783-1785. So I was studying all these guys and Renoko and I were having a phone conversation and I told him, I said, man, I'm, I'm, he, I think he asked me, what, what are you reading, Gershon? What are you looking, you know, what are you studying now? And I said, well, I'm looking at uh, uh, Godfrey Higgins, uh, Anacalypsis. Um, this is the paperback and I don't know how well you can see the because I have my two original copies are much bigger, much larger, and they're a different color. Okay. But this is Anacalypsis. He wrote these between 1833 and 1836. I think the second volume was completed posthumously. He had passed away mm-hmm. in some of the second volume. Mm-hmm. But in this, in Anacalypsis, of course, as you're familiar with this, with, uh, with Anacalypsis, he, he actually makes reference to uh, the Black Buddhas. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 these black guys, these mm-hmm. black deities, these African deities. Uh, he talks about the Black Christ, uh, I believe. Um, all these, some of the ancient, and I think it was Godfrey Higgins. All of the ancient gods, the guys in the ancient world, were black. He, he talks about all these ancient people; they were black. But one of the one of the mistakes that he makes is he actually he believes that in, um, Africans were born. We had our beginnings in Asia. And I think that's what he was really trying to, he was trying to trace that and trying to study uh, the origins of the human family. Mm-hmm. And I think I even mentioned this at the end of my article or, even, or in my notes that one of the critical mistakes he made was he traced us back yeah. to somewhere in, in Asia. I read that. Africa. I read you said that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, so Renoko, when I, when I explained to Renoko that I was, I was conducting this research, he said, well, hey, Ivan's, Ivan's going to allow me to to be guest editor for a special issue on the African presence in early Asia. And he asked me, would I consider submitting an essay mm-hmm. publication? Mm-hmm. So I said, well, I'd be honored to, brother. I was, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. And uh, I had never published anything major in a, in a scholarly journal before. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was had a little bit of anxiety about it because uh, I think I was, uh, you know, I was about 30. I was, you know, I was, I was still pretty young and I had done a lot of reading and mm-hmm. research, but I mean, it's almost like my reputation was on the line. So when I put, I put this out there, people are going to be reading it, critiquing it. And so I spent some time, I, I don't know how much time I had to, to, uh, to, to put it together, but I was very fortunate because I was also in touch with Gaynell, Catherine and Wayne Chandler. Mm-hmm. Both these brothers together published some magnificent uh, black history calendars mm-hmm. uh, in the middle 80s and maybe on into the 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and man, you're talking about these were like like little history books. Right. I mean, the photographs that they published and then the, the verbiage 
that they included with these people, like many history books, man. Yeah. Uh, they had one, well, I remember they had the Omic head. I've got a poster in my living room right now that I framed a black history poster. It's about 20 images uh, okay. on the poster and it's, it's hanging up in my, next to my first line library in my living room. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was I was talking to Wayne Chandler and Jane Nell at the time. We had a beautiful little network, man. Yeah. And they said, look, if you need some photos of the black Buddhas, mm-hmm. I got, we got Buddhas with like dreadlocks, you know, we got, you mm-hmm. know, just let me know what you need, Gershon. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, yeah, I need some photos, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think they actually sent the photos, I think they sent them straight to Renoko. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we all worked as a team, man. It was a beautiful thing. And so that's how I met Renoko. Uh, Ivan, uh, let me back up a little bit, man. Uh, when, when, when they came before Columbus first came out, it was published by Random House. 76, I see 76, 1976, 77. I had been, I heard an interview on the radio. He was, he was, he was on a book, a book tour. Uh, what do you call it? A, um, uh, book, book signing tour, I guess you call it, right? Okay. This is 1977. Uh, I, and I used to get up and listen to the radio. They had these talk shows on the radio every Sunday morning. And this was out of Chicago. They had an interview with Ivan Van Sertima. And, Man, I was just blown. I was, I mean, he got right away. He captivated my attention because of his accent, right? His accent and the stuff he was talking about. Now, this is <laughs> 1977. I had been out of high school like five years, mm-hmm. right? I've been yeah. out of high school. So I'm listening, and this is like, wow. He was actually scheduled to come, to, to speak at my high school. Mm-hmm. And what happened? We had a severe snowstorm that paralyzed the city. I mean, for two weeks, and he they had to cancel his presentation. I was devastated. Wow. What I did do wow. was I went right down to the black bookstore in Gary, Indiana, mm. and bought Came Before Columbus in hardback, twenty-five dollars. And I and later on, what happened? Uh, Ivan, some type of way, there was an article published in the Gary Post Tribune, which was our newspaper in Gary, the local, the, okay. you know, it was the, the, the main newspaper okay. in Gary. And they had a photograph of Vance. I still have it somewhere, a photocopy of it. They had an article about him, some kind of way, even though he didn't make it to the high school, there was still a story done about, you know, him coming. Okay. One of, one of the journalists was able to, was able to, maybe they called him on the phone or something. I don't know how it happened. But, uh, so I had, I, had, I actually, in, in, in a way, I was indirectly, I met, introduced to Van Sertima, uh in 19, when the book first came out. In 77, 78. But then he was invited to come here to Arizona on several occasions. Uh, he came to my institution at least twice. Uh, I actually interviewed Van Sertima after one of his presentations in a city called Scottsdale. And I have a photograph that I took. Or one of the, actually one of the people for the black newspaper, one of the photojournalists took of Van Sertima. He was sitting on a sofa. And uh, I wish I could have gotten in the photograph with him. We did. I did take a photograph with him at the University of Arizona in Tucson mm-hmm. uh, when he came. There was a group photograph of myself and a really good colleague of mine in Tucson. And I don't have a copy of that because for whatever reason, the sister that took the photograph, <laughs> she never gave us a copy. Mm-hmm. And I've been on it for two years. But anyway, uh, Van Sertima came. He, he would come here quite often. Um, and we would talk on the phone. Um, and I think before he got married, he was interested in a young, uh, a, a young lady that was, you know, he was, I think he would ask me for my advice one time about relationships, man. I said, man, look, <laughs> uh, I'm no expert in that, in that area, Ivan. Mm-hmm. I can't really help you with that one, but mm-hmm. we, we, we gotten kind of close, man. Cause mm-hmm. he, he was coming here to Mesa, I think to visit this, 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 right. this lady. Right. But, uh, yeah, he, um, he, he, he was here. He was here in Tucson. He was in Phoenix. Uh, and the Department of African American Studies in Tucson, um, they had funding. They brought Asa in, uh, Karinga, Wade Nobles. They were bringing all of the heavyweight African centered thinkers into the campus. Okay. And my good friend, my good friend, matter of fact, I was, uh, we, we hung out with Wade Nobles. Uh, we really spent some quality time with Wade when he came to Tucson mm-hmm. because my buddy was actually involved in the Department of African American Studies. Mm-hmm. And we were, we, we, so, uh, but I've had a wonderful journey, man, uh, 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 hanging with Van Sertima. Uh, matter of fact, he sent books. One time he sent some books, some of his books, uh, for me to be the caretaker. Mm-hmm. And I had, we carried them over to the campus and we 
we were kind of watching the books and at, while he was presenting, uh, we had the responsibility of kind of, mm-hmm. you know, watching and kind of monitoring the book sales for him. Uh, so, uh, but he was just, he was just a, a magnificent, uh, just a brilliant orator, man. The mm-hmm. man command the language. He could, he could, he could, uh, what do you call it? Uh, just um, astound an audience, mm-hmm. captivate an audience. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, he, the way he would recall his facts, he was like an encyclopedia. i and and that was his brilliance. I think was he could, he could, when the articles were submitted to the journal. Of course, he would read those articles sure. and almost verbatim, he could recite information from a lot of the essays that were submitted, right? Wow. And so it was almost like he was the <laughs> he was the author of the originator of a lot of those, but he was reading some of the articles that were submitted to the journal. Blacks in Science. I mean, you probably have all of the yeah, I do. all this. Yeah. yeah. That 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 journal of African civilization shook up the world. Okay. I really do think it was, and that and, and he he began editing that. In 1979, two years after he had published They Came for Columbus, is when he founded the Journal of African Civilizations. So what what would you see is what would you say about his strengths and weaknesses? He's more better. Was he better of an editor, or uh, or, I mean because (laughs) I never have really thought about him that way. What were his weaknesses? I I always saw it. You know, I hadn't analyzed him that way. Okay, no, just curious. uh, He Yeah. yeah, as I think. Uh, he was he was brilliant as an editor and certainly as a speaker as a presenter. Yeah. Uh, I had I had to give more thought to maybe some shortcomings <laughs> that he might have. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. I I thought he was uh, he even had to humble himself around Diop when he got in the presence of Shagan to Diop. Ivan says he felt like a student all over again. He was just mm. blown away. He was awestruck mm. by the Diop because Diop's reputation. He was just a giant. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It was mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, I've been. Um, I just, I just think in in, in that the, the discipline or in the area of Africans in the Americas before Columbus and before Christ, he was the master. Mm-hmm. That, that I mean, now there were others again before him, but he was able to marshal and assemble all of the available evidence. And and, and 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 publish it in one volume, one single volume. Right. I still that's the, that's the uh, you know that's a, that's a seminal text, of right. course, and that okay. text you all have to consult and study. I haven't seen anything since that, since mm-hmm. they came before Columbus, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I'm just not aware of another, but I haven't seen anything that I think uh, is is equal to the scholarship of Ivan Mansurdom in in that area. Okay. Uh, Columbia in America. I don't. I don't think there's nothing like that yet that I've seen there. I could be wrong. No, 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 no. I, I understand completely where you're coming from. Um, yeah. So you're selected to write your um, for for uh, Renuka Rashid. Renuka Rashid. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And of course, I I've read I've I've read what you wrote on several occasions, and I was I, I'm just still in awe with it because I thought it was magnificently done. Oh, thank you so much, brother. Um, thank you. Why Higgins so much? What 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 did Higgins do so much that Gerald Macy and and Vaughnie did not do? Did get your attention? Oh man, I think right in when you when you open the pages of Anacalypsis, and and I, I include this. I, I I actually have this quote in my. It's a short photo essay, actually. Um, maybe five or six pages that was published in, in uh, Africans in Early Asia. But um, when he says, I'm going to paraphrase him, uh, he says something like, <laughs> uh, he's, he's writing this book and he's introducing these facts about blacks in ancient history. Right. And I, I almost have to, have to look at it now because I'm drawing a blank on, no, on what really impacted me. But he said, I, 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 these, what I'm, what I'm sharing in this, and I, he says, perhaps when he was writing this in the 1830s, of course, we were in the peak period of the, 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 we'll call it the peculiar institution. Mm. You know, 1830, 1860 was right, the period of abolitionism, uh, and the right, yeah. Walker's appeal, the Antony yeah. Rebellion, and all that. But, uh, you know, at the time he says, I'm gonna I'm gonna reveal some extraordinary facts mm. about, about these black folks, mm. uh, and, and they're probably gonna be you know be difficult to accept and believe because 
of the current condition, mm-hmm. the current state. Right. And uh, we, may, we may have to read it verbatim, man, because it was so powerful. That struck me right in the introduction. I'm going to reveal some extraordinary facts about these black folks who, in, a, in ancient times, they ruled the world. They, they were the rulers. They were running things. They were in power, mm-hmm. and uh, they built civilizations. Well, I'll tell you what struck me. This is what really struck me. He said, I'm going to look at the origins of, the, of all the religions. I, I, I want to see where the, the genesis of the world, what well, the major religions of the world, uh, Christianity. Uh, he didn't get into. I don't think he got into Islam so much, but certainly Judaism, Christianity, and he. But he traced that. He traced that back to our African ancestors. Mm. Well, he said they were black people, but he didn't. But he said, look, the origin of the world religion of all these religions. Again, and I wish I could have looked at this right before we did the. No, no, here. don't worry, no worry. But, but I mean, he 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 just. He laid it out so beautifully in that and said, you know, black people were at the, were at the root mm-hmm. and the source of spirituality and, and religion, right? Wow. I said, wow, man. And so so did uh, so did uh, Count Von, the C.F. Von in Ruins of Empires. Yeah. So, but 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 uh, Godfrey Higgins said, I'm going to trace this back. I'm trying to remember this paragraph that really struck me. And I said, well, because he draws you in, and it was very intriguing to me. <laughs> And just, just kind of mind blows. I'm, I'm going to trace these black people. I'm going to go back before the slave trade. You know, I'm going to go back before this so-called dark ages that after had. I'm going to go back into antiquity and look at the ancient record of these black people. And I said, man. So mm-hmm. I was, he had me from that introduction. Mm-hmm. And then I can't remember what, what followed that. But um, one of the one of the other books that he does that in is is called the Celtic Druids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and there's a there's a half a page or so, maybe a page where he also talks about uh, Africans being a part of that whatever that Celtic Druid thing is that that's a part of Europe, I believe. Mm, that's the, it. The whole, mm-hmm. And Africans being in in, in being influential mm-hmm. and having a cultural presence. And and man, this is for the time that he was making these statements and these remarks. It's just, uh, it's very, it's rare, very rare, and uh, it's really extraordinary mm. for a European to be speaking favorably, in a favorable, in a, I mean, very speaking very highly about African people during the period of, of, of the Great Enslavement. Yeah. And he's going yeah. against this whole thing, this negative, stereotypical, yeah. this, uh, you guys being inferior. He said, no, 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 not in ancient times. And like my man says in uh, Before Color Prejudice, mm. uh, he says, look, we don't have this idea of, of, of African or black inferiority. It's not it's not there. Mm-hmm. We don't have, you know, uh, no record of this idea of black inferiority before, say, four or five hundred years ago. Right. right. Four years ago. Right. There's no record in antiquity. This uh, <clears throat> the ancients didn't have these racial biases, mm. that bigotry, that hierarchy was not there. It didn't exist. Mm. So uh, Higgins and uh, Albert Churchward, I haven't studied them in, in, in... I've looked at Massey and Higgins probably more than the others. Okay. And, uh, you know, so Higgins, again, got my attention. And, uh, again, the whole idea that he he theorized that we had our beginnings in Asia. Uh, well, you know, you're talking about 1830, of course, uh, a lot of the research that we have at our disposal now wasn't available then. Mm-hmm. Certainly, talk, when you look at the Africa being the origins of, of yeah. human civilization, of, of, uh, of uh, African origins of humanity, wasn't available. This even the anthropology was was still it was it wasn't even. I think anthropology had its beginnings in like the 1850s, 18. So yeah, it's pretty. So he can, he's way ahead of his time right. you know, in the 1830s, and mm-hmm. uh, so. Um, but I um, I had another friend who gave me a, it was an article about the life of Higgins. That, that it, see, they don't have much biography. They don't have much about his, um, his life and um, uh, his experiences in Anacalypsis. It's not there. So another friend of mine shared, and I don't even know where that document is now, but I was able to read a little bit more on his life and... Uh, and and uh, some of his other publications because he wrote some other books too, mm-hmm. and that, I gained further insight into his life and his interests, and so that helped me when I was. Matter of fact, some of that information 
is is right there in the, at the beginning of my article. Mm-hmm. The biographical stuff is right there, and that's where I got that from mm-hmm. because, of course, we didn't have Google. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. we couldn't Google right. on the internet and all that. So I was very fortunate that a friend of mine, I think I shared with him, I was doing some trying to write a piece on Godfrey Higgins, and he said, well, hey, brother, he was from New York. He said, man, I got a piece you need to check out. You right. know? So, right. so that's how it all came together. But I was uh, looking at John Jackson um, and the way he embraced Massey. He, I think he does the introduction to Gerald Massey's lectures. Uh, John Jackson always made reference to Gerald Massey and Albert Church Ward. Yeah. These rich guys, you know. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Godfrey Higgins. So looking at John Jackson and then the way John Jackson, uh, he always referred to Jay Rogers. And Jay Rogers also uh, makes mention of some of these early British writers. Matter of fact, um, the early black historians, especially when they began to to, to write about uh, African and continental African history, mm-hmm. They began to when they began to see uh, Count Valny's book uh, Ruins of Empires. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, they began to see those types of books. Um, even the Carter G. Woodsons and the Du Boises and the, you know, uh, I think I don't know if George Washington Williams we, we made reference to uh, these guys, but I think uh, Leo yeah. Hansberry did too. We, it's, oh, thank you for bringing me. Yeah, Hansberry. Leo, yeah, Leo Hansberry. Hansberry did too. So, mm-hmm. so, so. Um, C.F. Valmy, uh, uh, even Dr. Ben, I don't know if I've heard Dr. Clark Yes, he did. Him, but not, yes, he did. He did? Dr. Oh. Clark was a, he, he, he was a strong advocate. I won't say strong, but he, he made a strong mentioning of them in some of his lectures about you need to go back and read the, Ma- the Macy's and the, uh, I got the signs of symbols by, uh, by Church Lord. Church yeah, yeah, yeah. And. And well, I know Valny. Valny was a uh, man. They, we began to lean really heavily yeah. uh, because, as 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 another, another the listeners may not know this, that when Ruins of Empires uh, was translated to English mm-hmm. and published here in America, mm-hmm. they omitted three full, full three pages of the book. And this is this is actually documented on the back cover of the book. Really? Well, it was published by Black Classics Press. When Black Classics Press, they published the paperback. I have it right here. Wow. And right on the back, the back cover, just, they discussed the three pages that were omitted when the book was published in America. They omitted the three pages that discussed the African origin or the Nubian origins of, I guess it was Nile Valley Nubian origins of civilization. Mm. Right? Wow. And so this is actually written right on the back cover of Ruins of Empires, and get, and then I think Volney was invited to do some uh, uh, lectures across America. This is when he discovered he, he he must have picked up a copy of the book. He said, "Wait, wait, they 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 omitted three pages of my book." Hmm. And he he was really really um, he was furious, hmm. and he demanded that they reprint the book and include those three pages. Okay, so that's a major story that um, is uh, is talked about by uh, what's my man uh, Coates, Paul Coates, Paul Coates, who's Tanahisi's father. Yeah, uh, he, he, they discuss that on the back cover of the book. So it's man, but this is this is the level of of racial prejudice and race, racial bigotry uh, that, of course, you know, how are you gonna like Bonnie talks about? There are people now forgotten discovers while others are yet barbarians the elements of the arts and sciences a race of people now rejected uh from humanity right he, and I, I used to get, I have this memorized but mm-hmm. he said we found it on the study of the laws of nature those civil and religious systems which still govern the universe and then in another statement he talks about we were the founders of the spoken word you know, we we're the creators of the spoken word, which we still. We still <laughs> it's do. Interesting, he uses right. that. Right. I mean, speech, speech, and the spoken word, language. Right. Talks about Africans being there, uh, and and the founding of language and civilization, and so of course during the time the I don't know if it was the 1920s or 19 whenever his book was first published, it may have been in the 1800s. It had to be, I guess, in the, in the, maybe the 1820s, 1830s. Uh, it, it, it will be a huge contradiction, you know, when you're trying to preach and propagate the idea of African inferiority. Right. And it, and it's talking about we're the fountainhead of civilization, right? Right. right. And spirituality. So right. uh, they actually intentionally, deliberately omitted three pages from the book. 
Well, that, that, that's the length and breadth that they, that's how far they would go to miseducate the American public and certainly didn't want us to read and find mm -hmm. out about, mm -hmm. you know, this. So mm -hmm. that kind of pronouncement at that time, it, it, I mean, it was it was so revolutionary, you know, <laughs> it was so expressive. Incredible. So Wallace, he, he is really, um, I mean, whenever I, I have an opportunity to share anything about our history with students or with audiences, I, I try to always make mention of Ruins of Empires uh, about C.F. Alming. So um, this is a magnificent work. Uh, one of the few what we call, I would call objective, uh, unbiased, because he made trip, he traveled to Egypt. And he, of course, he looking at looking at what we call the shrinks. Yeah. He talked about him and um, Vivant Denon, mm. or D-E-N-O-N, uh, who was a contemporary of Wallace, who actually made the trip with Napoleon to Egypt in 1798, 1799. Mm -hmm. So it was years after Vaughn had published Ruins of Empires. Mm -hmm. And so Denon wrote about the character, the facial characteristics of the Sphinx and other images. They said, look, these, the lips are thick, yeah. you know, yeah. talk about the jaw structure yeah. and the profile. Hey, man, but these are African people. Yeah. I mean, and so, so yeah. I mean, you go in with a with with an open mind and an unbiased mind, you can see the evidence. You can see, even today, right. that these are these are certainly Afrocore African people. So uh, this is why it's so important for us to know uh, uh, about the Vaughnies and the Masseys and and the Albert Church Wars and and the Godfrey Higgins of the world. Right. It's right. So important. We we always, you know, uh, we 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 always of course, uplift and elevate uh, the Diops and the Obengas and the Van Sertimas and the Hansberries and the Du Bois as we, right. but alongside, you know, our own uh, distinguished scientists and uh, thinkers, we also can place uh, the non-African, uh, what I call anti-colonial thinkers as well, like, and uh, that's that's a beautiful thing to be able to do that. Yeah, it, it, it takes a lot of maturity too, if I'm, if, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. because... It's very difficult for people, especially if you've been oppressed for so long, mm. to, to go into history and, and look at it objectively. Like, set aside your emotions and really look at it objectively and put it in the content. Or in context. Yes. In context. I'm, just, I'm sorry. And a lot of us can't do that because we're so emotionally driven. So emotional. And, yes. and it's understandable. I mean, look, I mean, come on. We've gone through a lot to be so. But. Yeah. Yes. You got to be careful with it because if you're if you go into history always looking for something to validate how you feel, then you're doing a disservice of history within itself. And oftentimes you may stunt your own growth because you're right. overlooking some things, you know. And at mm -hmm. least that's my opinion, anyway. Yeah. Um, but, you know, yeah. but that's that's just where I stand. Yeah, it, it, it's it's beautiful. One of the things that I sometimes uh, meditate on and. And just kind of reflect on is the fact that we we have so much incredible information from our own mm -hmm. uh, from from continental African scholars mm -hmm. uh, such as Diop, mm -hmm. a multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this brother's a you know, physicist. Uh, 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 what is he? Physicist, uh, <laughs> linguist. Yeah, he's linguist. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? All these disciplines that he studied, and his student Obinga. But you got you got the continental scholar, and then you got the scholars in the diaspora, uh, I mean of African descent. Yeah. And then you got those non-African folks. Man, we just got such a tremendous, uh, <laughs> I mean, what do you call it? reservoir? Yeah. Uh, a reservoir of, of information and knowledge to pull from. And my thing is, I used to say, man, there's no excuse for us being miseducated. There's no reason we should be <laughs> we should be ignorant. Right. And un should be we should not know ourselves. Yeah. Uh, we have over a century. These brothers have made sacrifices, man. I mean, I mean, and sisters, you know, like Drusilla Just, Houston yes. and others. Yes. I mean, tremendous. I mean, they've done the research. They've and she wasn't done. even classically trained. She wasn't even no. classically trained. No. Just no. I mean, oh, and and I some of her people lived here with, in Phoenix. As a matter of fact, she. She passed away here. Yes. I think it was 1940. Right in Phoenix. Yes. I, I didn't. Did I go to her? No. Somebody gave me a photograph of her, her tombstone, her gravesite. Mm -hmm. But her, she actually, uh, was a, well, let me say it like this. My, one of my dear friends, 
his wife was Drusilla Houston's niece. And and that's why she came into Phoenix because she had people here. She had relatives here. I actually, <laughs> this is another one of those extraordinary things I've got to put in one of my memoirs. I actually went to the home of Drusilla Houston's, one of her nieces. She had handwritten copies of volumes two and three of Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire. I saw wow. where she she had she had planned to do a second and third volume. Wow. And and uh, matter of fact, well, I think her name was Mary Lou Harris. Actually, this is another thing, brother. This is extraordinary. In the introduction to Wonderful Ethiopians, Paul Coates, the founder of Black Classics Press, Todd Nahisi Coates' his father, right? Mm-hmm. He came here to Apache Junction, Arizona, which is about maybe 15, 20 miles from where I live. He came here to interview these very people I'm telling you about, Laura Harris and Richard Harris. Richard Harris is my, was my friend. He wrote a book called uh, The First 100 Years, The History of Blacks in Arizona. The first black journalist to write for the Arizona Republic newspaper. Uh, just, I mean, he was, he was the first in so many ways, but his wife, is that whole Dungey family, uh, they had, uh, they founded a newspaper called the Oklahoma Black Dispatch, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. This is Drus Drusilla Houston used to write editorials mm -hmm. for her, her <laughs> I think these were her uncles, I think, I believe, her brothers or her uncles, they founded the, one of the, I guess it was one of the first, maybe oldest black newspaper in, in, in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. I believe it was also. So, man, and I'm going to bring it on even closer to home now. Tony Dungy, who was the former football coach. Did he win a Super Bowl Absolutely. one year? Yeah, and um, he, he, he won in, in uh, uh, Indianapolis. He left Tampa and he went to the Colts and won it with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tony, Tony Dungy is a cousin of these people I'm talking about. Drusilla Dungy. He's in that family. When they have family reunions, he goes to the reunions. People, wow. uh, people told me, yeah, Tony, he was there. My buddy said, yeah, he was, you know, he's walking around eating barbecue and right. going on the car. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's a beautiful <laughs> thing. But, you know, Paul Coates, if, if people are familiar with uh, the book, because Black Classics Press reprinted it mm. uh, around 85 or 86, 1985, around the same time the journal came out. Mm -hmm. And Renoko has done some stuff. Renoko mm -hmm. Rashidi has done some things with Drusilla Houston's mm -hmm. work too. Mm -hmm. But in that in that introduction, I think Asa Hilliard does the afterword or the forward. I can't. I haven't looked at it in so long. But he mentions the fact that he came to Phoenix, Arizona, and interviewed these people about Drusilla Houston's life. But I was actually fortunate that uh, Mrs. Harris. They took me. She took me to. I think it was her sister. And I actually saw. Man, I wish I had my cell, I had a cell phone or something. I could have took photographs. Wow. She had handwritten copies. She had, they would, I guess they were just about ready to send to a publisher, you know, but they were still in the, um, I mean, she was been maybe, maybe in the research stages or something, but she actually had, had planned to do, which she talks about, she had planned to do a second and third volume of Wonderful Ethiopians. So uh, it's, it's, it, I've had some wonderful experiences in my my little brief life here in, in Arizona too. So I, I, I'm in awe of all the greatness coming together, right? And here you are, here you are, you're sitting, <laughs> in, you're sitting in the middle of it. And I mean, we, if you really reflect back on it, which I know you do, you look at your beginning stage in the last 40 years, and you come up to now, and you see this new generation, right? Which leads right. me, which leads us to the next topic. Okay. So. In this in this generation, and, and you said it so well, I, I love it. I'm going to bring it up. You wrote several articles, all right? Mm -hmm. You did. Um, you published the in the Arizona Informant newspaper, the Journal mm -hmm. of the African uh, Civilizations, the Journal of African American History, the Journal of Pan African Studies, um, mm -hmm. Odyssey. West Magazine and Chicken Bones Online Magazine. That's where your <laughs> articles are at, right? That's yeah. where some of your articles are at, right? So yeah. then you write this magnificent piece, which I'm quite sure is probably your favorite, too. I think you mentioned it to me. Uh, you wrote on the, the N-word in the psychology of the black oppression. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please elaborate. <laughs> oh, oh, man, what? You know, it's interesting, but, uh, brother, that uh, it, it just is something that the language, uh, when you, um, I think, to defame yourself, to denigrate and dehumanize yourself. And I think language, uh, I, 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 well, you know, to use the language of the oppressor, number one. Are you still there? Okay, I, I didn't see you moving for a minute. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, here. I, I, I believe that we, our language should be uh, emancipatory. It should be the language of liberation. Language, you know, we say we're beautiful. You know, we, we're, we're descendants of the, I mean, look at our ancestors, man. Look at our, our heritage. So to demean oneself to me, uh, if you don't love yourself and, and, and respect yourself, and, 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 and Garvey said this, you know, all of our great leaders, Malcolm said it, all of our great leaders and thinkers, Francis Welsing, Neil, and you can't use the language of oppression. You're talking about, I'm free, I'm independent, uh, I'm a progressive thinker, and here it is, you're still using a term that was used. I don't care what the history was before the great enslavement. We know that term was used. Um, I mean, it, 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 they, I mean, we were like, <laughs> whatever our numbers were, that was the way they referred to us as the N-word, when we were lynched castrated, lobotomized, you know, I mean, I mean, that, that word was used so much, like Richard Price, said, I thought it was my name, you know, I thought that was my name, so yeah. I'm, my thinking is, when we move off the plantation, you know, when you, when you, they say from the plantation to the ghetto, but when you move into a space now where you, you practice self-determination, right, yeah. and mm -hmm. a part of self-determination is to name oneself, to identify oneself, you know, you, uh, how did John Henry Clark say it? Uh, slave dogs and slaves are named by their masters, mm. but free people name themselves, right? Absolutely. So part of our, we, we know that we were colonized, mm -hmm. and we know that right now, even at this instant, you and I are speaking the colonial language sure. of what they call it, right? So our our names were given; they were named; they named us. I said, and this is one of the things that Ngugi Watiango talks about: mm -hmm. is Africans prefer; they have a preference to speak you know, these European language rather than their own uh, language. And so this thing is universal. He calls it uh, the cultural bomb that was dropped on us was more dangerous than military, political, or economic weapons. The cultural bomb, right? And so and this whole thing with the N-word is, what's amazing to me was in our evolution, this evolution of language, is how we buried the word Negro. We, we actually, in the 70s, we said, no, we're not Negro, we're black, right? So you don't hear nobody running around call, identifying themselves as a Negro in 2000 and in the 21st century, right? So we, we actually, collectively, we, we buried or abolished the term Negro, but then the other word that rhymes with bigger mm. hung around. How, and I don't understand that whole... Uh, I don't understand how we get we, we, we get rid of one. We one is phased out and then one survives. Let's, I, I can't. Let's, and, let's, and that's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll, go ahead. No, I say I was gonna say. So we had we had, we had I had panel discussions. I wrote articles. Um, we had uh, we we had an organization uh, back in 2007 2008. Uh, for a few years, we were on this crusade and this campaign. To abolish the N word, right. you know, I mean, we were on the radio, we were on TV. I was involved with it. Matter of fact, we had a there was an event. They went on a, like a school strike here because we were supposed to present, uh, and the schools were closed here a couple weeks ago, and uh, so they had to they reschedule that one. But my thing is, I just think we we need when we refer to one another, again, uh, if we're not oppressed, if we say we're not oppressed, <laughs> and we're not. Uh, uh, you know, we're not inferior, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we need to move away from that language, man. And, and you, I don't, I don't think there's any way you can glamorize it and uh, and 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 put put uh, put honey and sugar on it, you know, sugar coated, make it sound sweet. Now it's interesting because I've listened to the debates by two of our, I mean, brilliant uh, uh, intellectuals, public intellectuals, Michael Eric Dyson and Cornell West mm -hmm. have debated the N word. Matter of fact, Cornell. Has two on two of his CDs. The, uh, I think there's a 12-minute 
debate dialogue that that Tavis Smiley actually kind of moderates. Yeah. Between on that, yeah. yeah. And so Dyson, he says it's a term of endearment. We use it in the house, but then it, it when it got out of the house with hip hop, music, popular culture, it, it it was okay maybe when it was just us in the hood, but when it goes international and it goes to the continent and people are doing it. Uh, with pride, <laughs> and they, you know, I mean, it's like they're having fun with it. Oh, uh, and, and and this thing again, it's like the concept of black inferiority. It went global, and this N word, man. I look, how do we look? You know, again, just like you, there's other derogatory terms you can use to refer to women. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, and, and I, I agree with Francis Welsing to kind of summarize with my thoughts. Uh, you can't. And Gil Scott Heron said this as well in one of his songs. You know, you you, you can't <laughs> think of yourself as a divine, mm-hmm. divine, beautiful spirit or being, and then on the other side you defame and denigrate yourself. And and that's that's probably the most extreme form of self hatred, self hatred and double consciousness. Even if we could use Du Bois's term, mm. I mean, there's something going on with that. Um, you know, you call yourself. We say we want to be beautiful. If you love your blackness. Uh, you know, if you love your features, you love your hair, which a lot of us don't. We're bleaching our skin, we're lightening our skin, yeah. all over the world. So, uh, but to me, you know, we said slavery, chattel slavery ended 1865, right? Yeah. And then Jim Crow, right around 1965, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You perpetuate your own oppression when you do that, in my opinion, because it's a psychological thing. And that's what I've dealt with, the psychology of black oppression. And I think Naeem Akbar, all of our brilliant psychologists and psychiatrists, mm-hmm. when you talk about the language of liberation, <clears throat> and because um, language, your thoughts are going to dictate your behavior. And if we perceive ourselves as, again, um, as as uh, dignified people mm-hmm. and 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 uh, what is it? I mean, we we've got integrity and character, all these virtues of my eye, right? We've got all this beauty, and then you still want to use that word. And I've seen people try to try to twist it, and try to play. They play on it like we. This is one of the ancient terms we refer to ourselves. I, I mean, come on, man. But oh, speaking so, of which, speaking of which, can I can I just share with the? Um, I'm going to post this in my chat too, but can I just yeah. share for a moment with the audience what you wrote? Okay, please do. Thank you. All right. 388 years after the first 20 African indentured servants, who were erroneously called niggars, were brought to Jamestown, Virginia, 1619. We are still using the N-word. I say. 200 years years after Haitian blacks won their freedom in 1804, becoming the first free black independent nation in the Western Hemisphere, we are still using the N word. Uh, yeah. 142 years after President Lincoln's proclamation, the Civil War, and the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which finally abolished chattel slavery in the North America, we are still using the N word. Mm. 85 years after Marcus Garvey, the Harlem Renaissance, and the New Negro Consciousness Movement, we are still using the n-word 50 years after the landmark supreme court case brown versus board of education emmett till's lynching and rosa park's courageous stand in the deep south we are still using the n-word 40 years after black leaders malcolm x and martin luther king and med and medgar evers was assassinated we are using the n-word 40 years after the black it's beautiful and I am black and proud movements. We are still using the N word. And finally, mm-hmm. 40 years after the other N word, Negro in parentheses, was virtually obliterated from the black language and black life, we are still using the centuries old, despicable term, nigger. Wow. End the quote. Wow. That's what you wrote. Okay. I don't think I could have wrote it no better than that either. I, you know, sometimes uh, I'm I'm so pleased that you did that because I don't need to say another another word. 
I did allude to the term Negro, uh, which, which is amazing to me how we we were able to do that. And and I love what my brother Richard Pryor was able to do, man. Mm-hmm. And his example, that story he told us about when he was in South Africa. Yeah. He had that epiphany and yeah. he just woke up, looked around. He said, "Man, I don't see no, I don't see no niggas. I don't no. see no Negro no eating. Mm-hmm. There's none. Here. You know what? I've been wrong." Yeah. I yeah. gotta rethink my stuff, right? I gotta, yeah. I gotta regroup, man. I, there ain't no, ain't nobody, man. Yeah. And he said, as long as he was in Africa, he never thought about it. Use the term, you yeah. know. Yeah. So as as Richard Pryor, the look, the N word was in his DNA. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, look here. Did you look at his first, his first three? <laughs> yeah. That made him. Yeah. I'm bicentennial. Yeah. That N must be crazy. Yeah. Uh, and I remember all albums, man. And so. You know, he he made it kind of funny and, and amusing to use it, but if he could have been, if he could move away and stop all these other comedians, man, I thought that was a wonderful example that Brother Pryor set for us. And uh, he was trying to teach us a lesson, tell us, man, look, y'all need to, leave, I, if I, we need to let that word go. So what you just read, that litany that you just read, man, is, um, I haven't read it in a while, and I was so pleased, uh, I'm, I'm just humbled that the ancestors gave me that to lead off because I wanted to just kind of, kind of summarize, yeah. you know, the, the history just in the last, what I make a thing. I went back two or 300 years, but yeah. how, how does the word, that word linger and endure and survive all of all those generations. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's interesting brother, because I did hear the word used in my family, uh, my dad, my father, my grandparents, uh, I, I do remember, it seems like if we ran across a black, if we encountered a person with dark skin, uh, at least in terms of my, my some of my family members, mm-hmm. the feet, it, 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 uh, you know, he was always, if it was something you didn't like or he was disgusting, then you called him the N-word. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was it was almost, um, and, uh, you know, I know when I was a teenager, I realized that some of my girlfriends, a little lady, oh yeah, you my so and so, you know. Yeah, we, sure, you know, sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. But 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 you know we didn't uh, when it, when it got into the music, and 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 the movies and you know I mean those images that I mean I think that that thing, people now it's so it's in some of the music so much, and then but we don't want white folks to use the term. We don't want we don't want to we you know I mean there's a there's a video, the N word divided we stand I think it's called and we used to show this to students. Uh, a portion of it, and then we would have a dialogue with the students. But there's a scene with Tupac. I think this was in the, in Boston Public, and Tupac has a white friend. They're walking down the hall, school, and 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 the guy, I guess he's he's using the N word, the white guy. And and Tupac said, "Man, you can't use that word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't do that. Just because I do it, you know, you can't do it. But 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 then it's you, it's so repetitious and so." You hear, it so, I mean, I don't hear it, but I know other people do, mm-hmm. uh, and other young people, and so it's like becomes almost like second nature in a way. Yeah. Let me make one, let me give one more yeah, example. Of something. Uh, definitely close it out. This is, I want you to close it out and give your last words of wisdom to the audience. Close it out. <laughs> let me just say that I had, I, I go to the movies a lot. I, I've loved movies since I was young. The latest Purge, um, the film. There was a, I, I know it was, it was dealing with the purge, and although that that whole concept is, is really archaic, barbaric, and 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 savage, it's, it's just, but it's, I mean the fact that you got what 24 hours to just kill anybody you want to kill, right? You can purge. But the brother in the film, one of the main characters, he was a business owner, a role model, a mentor in the community. There were three opportunities in the film he could have used the N word. Mm. And he chose to use Negro. Mm-hmm. And for me, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I, that, look, that's what I walked away with. <laughs> I, didn't, mm-hmm. I mean, I enjoyed the, the entire movie, but I was telling my friends, I've, I've even presented in presentations, I've shared this. I said, go check out the movie. Mm-hmm. He's three, he has three opportunities, and he could have went there, but he chose to say, my Negro. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I would rather see people do that because at least that's a Spanish term means black. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You're gonna, but for them to present that in a Hollywood film, 
And I thought that was so, it was just outstanding for him to, uh, and I, I, it may have been his idea to do that, but I, I thought that was really powerful and I thought it was really necessary. So uh, I don't know if you've seen it. No, I have but, not. I got one yeah. more, I got one more question for you. Go ahead, brother. So ahead. how can you convince the people who call themselves African-American to just call themselves an African when need be, when when the time is suited. You know that that that's it, you have. There's a certain amount of, of I guess pride and historical consciousness. Okay. Uh, historical awareness that one has to have. Uh, there's a book called To Be African or Not to Be, right? Um, and uh, I mean, but to be an African person, you know, for many many years. I mean, because we were like this is my Malcolm. I mean, we were not we were taught self hatred. We certainly we were taught to be anti-African. Mm-hmm. It took us a long time. To, well, check this out. This is an interesting. Things kind of went full circle because in the beginning, we used to identify our organizations as African Lives Number 457, or you know, um, uh, African Freedom School. Or, uh, um, we had organizations that we where we actually the, the, the Bethel AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal, and the other one. What is the other one? Uh, you know, but it, I don't know if that was in the 1800s. I believe it was. We actually de- defined ourselves as Africans. Yes. Right? Yes. At, at one point, and I think we, but, but I think that happened, if my memory is correct, when the society began to reject us. We were trying to assimilate and trying to move in, trying to integrate. We wanted to become Americans, you know, and. They said no. They closed the door, slammed the door. Said no, no. You, you, we, we're not embracing you. Hmm. And I think, then, I think then we stepped back, and then we began to say, okay, now I'm proud to be African. Now we assume the African identity. I remember reading something about that, and I think it was an African writer that actually brought that to my attention in, a, in a, something he wrote. That it was, uh, it wasn't until white America or white society rejected us, just, just closed that door. Uh, you can't be a part. I mean, this, you can't be a part of my my society, my civilization. And they said, "Well, okay, now I'll be. I'm going to be African now." But you know, we went through that whole evolution of what was it, Negro, colored, mm-hmm. uh, Afro mm-hmm. American, mm-hmm. black, yeah, but Alien. You know, I mean, we went through that whole all of that litany of terms, and and uh, finally, I, I know it was J- Jesse had a little. He said he. he I think he verbally he. He made a statement, and some other people like Oprah might have got on board. I don't know who I was involved. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think, huh? Yeah, I know what you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think the term African, African American, brings us close. At least we can identify, we connect. Like John Henry Clark always says, with land, language, culture. If we don't know exactly what village or what 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 part of West Africa, what region we 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 come from. And now with DNA, you can kind of you can kind of find that out. I think if you can trust that stuff, right? Yeah. But you know, just the identification with being African again, because of course, many of us rejected Africa. We rejected. We didn't want to be. We didn't. We didn't want to be black at one time. Yeah. You know, we we didn't want to be black, and certainly not African. You know, because it was almost like we were being anti-American. But now we've re-embraced the concept. I like what Renoco says. I'm an African person. I'm African, and I just happen to be. I'm in America, but I'm still an African person. So I don't know if we'll ever get any closer in terms of a, 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 a more definitive term than African American. But I know it's problematic because we run into some people in the Caribbean and other parts of the the diaspora who really can't they can't fall under the umbrella of African American, so to speak, or maybe they don't want to. But um, just the fact that we that's one of the terms that we're using in 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 uh, in, uh, in language and in articles and, and in speeches and uh, we're and I, I use black sometimes interchangeably I'll say black black too you know black American or black but we know that's that's a color and that doesn't connect us to uh, right. to geography right. or the history right. so uh, because again black was always something negative <laughs> something you know. Um, uh, you know, dirty, yes. nasty, mm-hmm. repulsive. 
We said, no, I'm black and I'm proud. I'm, I'm black and beautiful. So I, I was I was coming of age in that era. So I still would say black every now and then, you know, black power, you know, right, like this. Right, right. But uh, I, I'm, we know that we're Africans, uh, you know, and we just happen to be dislocated, <laughs> like be dislocated in, uh, in the Americas. Uh, so um, I, that was to me, that was that showed some collective growth and acceptance of our African uh, heritage and our, our antecedents coming out of Africa. Mm-hmm. Because, I, I mean, you know, but it's, it's like in the beginning we were calling ourselves Africans and then we moved away from it and now we've kind of gone back to it. Let me just say one one final one. I, this is a closing remark. I got to say this. You know, it's I think it's probably more symbolic that Barack Obama became the first, I'll say, African-American president, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. What was so interesting to me, and I thought uh, it was more than interesting. It was it was it was it was it was it was monumental to me that he had an African name. The fact that he has an African name, the first mm-hmm. uh, president of African descent, mm-hmm. has an African name, and his so does his wife has his last name, and his daughter's the name Obama. Mm-hmm. When I look at Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and Shirley Chisholm and who else ran for who else black ran for I mean, but if they had be, if they had gotten elected, if they had won the election, they wouldn't have had an African name. Yeah. So the fact that Barack is the first and he also had carried that name, man, that took us back. Yeah. Me, you know, I mean, it was like we were beginning to decolonize our minds. So it was just it was it was funny. And then he married a black woman too because I always say he could have gone the other way. Yep, that's true. And he would have, you know what I mean? He, that's he, true. To me, how you go? How you going How you gonna hate on him? If that's he, true. If he went with a, a Caucasian woman. Because yep. Of yep. So the fact that he has an African name, I thought that was powerfully, powerfully symbolic, uh, and uh, it meant a whole lot to me. And I know again there are problems. People criticize his politics and things like that. But the fact that this man carried, I think that was an ancestral thing. That was a, almost a divine decree. You need, I mean, how did how, how could that happen? We we had our names systematically removed from us. Right. That were taken from us, our right. names and languages, and and, and 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 some of the family structures and the 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 the, uh, the essential elements of culture, mm-hmm. like Franklin Fraser says, were taken from us. Mm-hmm. We're trying to cover those. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is what our discussion is all about. Uh, today, but but by the first the brother having that African name and then having the uh, the beautiful Michelle Obama mm-hmm. by his side, man, is uh, it's almost like the film Black Panther, you know? It's almost yeah, like the, absolutely. the kind of stuff absolutely. that I see in those beautiful chocolate sisters. Right. Uh, the African languages. That's another conversation. True. But I'm looking to my three year old grandson is here in my house right now, and. That's his hero, and I didn't have a Black Panther mm-hmm. when I was three years old. Mm-hmm. You know, just mm-hmm. I didn't have that kind of superhero. So, no. uh, why would we still be using the N word in the age of Obama and in the age of the Black women? We got to move away to some more positive and progressive languages as we, if we really truly, truly see ourselves as a free and self-determined people in the 21st century. Well, Professor, I really appreciate you, man. I really do. You, my yeah, elder, you know. my Baba, you know. <laughs> Oh wait, I had to. I had to do this, man. You, it's been a a, a deep blessing for you to um, to uh, grace me with your presence on my first interview, and um, I, I definitely know we're gonna have many more. Um, I really want. I, I just want people to take this opportunity to appreciate the elders such as yourself, who's who's been doing this, and those books in which you have. Um, have presented to us to start buying. I've you, you saw me on Facebook before I deactivated my account. Eventually, I'll, I'll go back on. But um, some I, I'm just rethinking my strategy. But um, what I'm trying to get people to do is start picking up more information so that we can eradicate some of those negative connotations, you know, and we can reestablish some self-esteem. And, 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 and achieve the brilliance. The Journal of Pan African Studies. My uh, oh, I, I you know you know I'm about to go get that book. Yeah, I'm, well, shame we, on we you. Got, we got one for you, brother. Uh, <laughs> no, listen, no, listen, listen. As a way of, in, in the spirit of reciprocity, 
for all that you have done, all that you do, and for this, this wonderful opportunity this morning. I will autograph a copy and put it in the mail to you. Oh, man. Monday? No. This is, we, in the spirit of my eye and reciprocity, this is the way we do the universe. This is the beauty of knowing your history and your ancestral heritage. Uh, I couldn't do enough uh, to return the favor and the gesture of what we've done this morning. This is priceless. So um, thank you. Thank I, you. I want to uh, just just show my uh, appreciation to you as a token of my appreciation. Uh, you will have one. Thank you. Uh, however long it takes to arrive in your mailbox, good brother. I'm not, I got time. Uh, uh, <laughs> I yeah, got time. But, Trust me, you're fine. This is something that I'm really hoping that uh, we've actually, I, I was so very proud and deeply honored that we were able to pull this project off. Okay. Because uh, we had to get some things translated from French to English. You talking about, you, we, you and I were talking about the uh, the challenge that we had this morning with this with this Skype interview. And I had some of those same challenges when we did the journal. I was, uh, again, I was in a great position uh, with my colleague, mm -hmm. Itabari M. Zulu, mm -hmm. uh, my, my partner, Obadeli Williams, who transitioned. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be my co-editor, uh, but he had some health issues, and he wasn't able to fulfill uh, some of his, uh, his promises he had made for me. We got it done, though. We got it done. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to show people this because uh, right now I think we may have to read if we do another reprint, I pr probably have about 20 mm -hmm. because this was self-published. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, I really uh, I'm proud of the essays that we were able to include. It's some good reading. I'm really proud of the article that I wrote. Thank you. And it's uh, yeah. all that. I really so thank look you forward again. to it. Yes. Thank you again for the opportunity. I know you and I both took, took time away yeah. from our families to do this. But you continue to do the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I uh, hope that we'll do a follow up. We yes. get into some other things. We'll be talking again, but Absolutely. I'm glad we were able to figure the technology out and get this whole thing done. And uh, so I'll say <laughs> uh, just peace and blessings to you, you and too. your family, and continue the great the great project that you yes, that sir. you uh, this great path that you're on right now with your your network as well. Well, well thank you so much, and uh, I'll be reaching out to you this week. I'll I'll text you my uh, my address, and furthermore, I'll be having I'll put that link on. Uh, my page, so everyone can get on there and and buy this book and add it to their library and read and read. Yes, thank sir. you, thank you so much, Elder. I appreciate you. And, thank uh, you so much, my brother. All right, all right. You <laughs> enjoy. All right. You too. Enjoy your day now, okay? Ashe Harambe, as we always say. Ashe, <laughs> Ashe. Peace. Peace. Peace.